in worship this morning. Say amen. amen. All right, here we go. this morning and um, usually in the beginning here we go off with our announcements and our prayer requests um, so if I can go ahead and start with your annou uh, announcements on the right hand side of your bulletin so this is number one we apologize for any inconvenience caused due to our water line repair um, but we would like to thank you um, with the patience and cooperation um, we are in the process of fixing uh, this issue at the time. And we also have a reminder today, and I made sure I gave mine to Auntie Sandy this morning because I will definitely forget and walk off with it, but um, we are collecting the completed WBBC self-study forms, um, which are due today, and that is um, to hand to our pastor search committee. Um, we are taking surveys to find out right now really what we are looking um, for in our future pastor, um, God willing. I know he's already chosen one for us. And so um, every help that we can um, have from you as far as input um, will also help us um, to find that person. Um, next Sunday, January 29th, will be our communion Sunday. And um, the Pastoral Search Committee will also meet after church service um, next Sunday, the 29th. Um, beginning February 5th, the Children's Sunday School um, will restart Zoom classes while also continuing to do live classes at our church um, here. Information to connect to Zoom class um, will be provided in the coming weeks. And if you have any information, or further information that you need to follow up on, you can contact Auntie Kim um, Ishibashi at her email um, listed there. We also have the January-February newsletter um, for the HPBC um, that you can view online and the um, contact is there. And the rest are pretty much the same um, information about masks, so you are welcome to wear your mask. Um, still, and we still do practice um, that here, um, social dis distancing as well as hand washing, just to prevent, um, you know, anything. Um, if you look at our prayer requests at the bottom, we would like to ask for continuance guidance um, for our deacons, our pastor search committee, and the property and facilities uh, management committee, um, all those that are involved with our church right now, because we are still... Um, trying to get everything together um, and getting it ready for hopefully our grand opening soon. Um, also for the repair of our church water line as I mentioned before. 
and prayers for healing, peace, and comfort um, for the families and loved ones of the recently deceased um, Jeff and Carla Takamine, as well as for Lydia Anova. And we also would like to add there um, for their grandson as well and the rest of their family, which I'm sure um, are suffering the grief at this time. It was funny because I really, um, I personally did not know them. Um, and I didn't realize that um, I had a conversation with Mrs. Takamine one day and I thought to myself, wow, oh, what a what a wonderful lady, she's so nice. I don't know where I met her, if it was at church or something, but after I had a conversation with her, I thought to myself, wow, oh, this, this lady is such a sweet person. You know, and then when I saw her picture in the paper and I put the name to the picture, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's the lady that I spoke with. And I was like, wow, she's such a wonderful person. So, you know, um, we definitely want to pray for their family. Um, I also have um, in-house, I have Auntie Malie to my left here. And she had asked that we keep her in prayer. Um, she is currently dealing with some health issues. Um, she has a lump in her tongue. And she will be going... Um, at the end of this month, on the 31st, to hopefully get it removed. Um, and she's a little nervous about it, right? We're humans, we get nervous about stuff like that. So if you can continue to keep her in prayer, um, and also the doctors and nurses that will be working on her at this time. And we have all the other prayer requests listed um, below, our COVID impacts, government leaders, both local, state, and federal our university students, all our friends and families that we have list, um, listed there with help and other concerns. And also, um, lastly, but definitely not least, our families in the military. So if we can go ahead and um, bow our heads in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you so much for such a beautiful day, dear Lord. Thank you for leading us here. Thank you for this time that we can freely worship you, dear Lord. We thank you for um, just, just making all things possible, dear Lord. We pray that we continue to praise you in all that we do as we serve you in our community, in our church, in our families, dear Lord. We thank you for this day, and we pray that as we lift your name on high through music, through our um, our lessons today, dear Lord, and through our speaker, we just pray that you would just give us the guidance and opportunity to spread your love throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm going to have you all rise with us as we begin our worship service. If you are able to, we may stand. If you are not able to stand, you can also sit. You can do whatever you like in this worship service. So if we're standing too long, you get tired, don't be afraid to sit down. If you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. If you want to clap, clap. All right, <laughs> dance, dance. dance. <laughs>
instructions last week. Thank you for bringing a friend. <laughs> so we're going to kick it off with another nice old but only I'll be now, my vision. Thank you. 
our moderator of White Care Baptist Bible Church, and he's going to introduce our speaker to me. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Deacon Dan Belcher, and before I get into what I'm supposed to be doing, I have an announcement. I just finished my second Corinthians. I'm going to start uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians in Sunday school next week. My wife and I are some of the original charter members of this church. Uh, Pastor Ian Sakai wanted to set up a church in Waikaiuka. We had come from Kamana Baptist Church. And, uh, well, that started over 25 years ago. We didn't spend 40 years in the wilderness. We spent some time as a home church, and then some time at Waikia in an uh, elementary school, and then at the YMCA, and most recently at Kamana Baptist Church. And we have grown along. We bought property, part of the, the uh, land by the YMCA, with the plans to build church there. And it's been about 10 years. Harvey was very instrumental in part of the planning, and so was Craig Sigeoka. But we planned to go there, but God often leads us elsewhere. Uh, we've had an amazing difficulty getting a permits. And then Helene brought, to our knowledge, this property. This wonderful building, this wonderful property, which was in our budget, we could buy it and have actually a bigger church than, than, than we had planned for. And it is in the Uka area. That was our original name. Uh, and so we are where we're supposed to be. So Helene brought it to us and we started the process and we realized that not all the permits had been completed. And without Raymond Tunoy and his associate, Diane Oshiro, we still couldn't be here. They spent so much time, so much energy, and so much money actually to fix up what needed to be done to make the permits cured, which they have been, so we could buy the property. And so I really want to thank personally myself and as a church to Mr. Tanoi and Mrs. Shiro. And I'm going to ask my wife to give you lay, and I'm going to ask all of you to give them a round of applause. <laughs> we cannot be here without their assistance, without their work, without that. So Raymond and Diane, can you please stand so everybody knows who you are? Thank you so much. Uh, God leads us not always where we want to go, but where he wants us to go. So he, obviously he wants us here. And without your help, we would not be here. And I do want to thank you again for that. There's some others I would like to thank too. And they are actually Helene Tajiri and Craig Shigioka. Without their work also uh, to get all this done, we could not be here, and so I want to give them a round of applause. <laughs> Finally, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Harvey Tajiri. Uh, Harvey has been a member of our church, and he's going to give us a two-part uh, message. So you're going to have to come back next Sunday for the second part. As most of you know, Harvey is a uh, retired politician. But that doesn't mean that he can't go on and on and on. So uh, <laughs> we have a treat for us. So Harvey, please come up and uh, give the message. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, am I on, Lisa? Yes. OK, thank you. Well, thank you and good morning. Um, I was kind of concerned because when Dan came up over here and the one, um, Sandy said that uh, there's going to be some stuff and I'm going to be introduced, I said, oh my goodness, my two hours, my two hours sooner now, I'm going to be cut down, I need all the time. Now, to let you folks know, my wife is in the back there, just to let you know, when I talk too long, she does this. <laughs> If I still don't stop, then she does this. <laughs> and I really don't stop, she does. 
<laughs> well, I got news for you, honey. I cannot, I, I cannot see that far back. <laughs> Too bad. Okay. So, but anyway, I thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to share with you this new word. But um, the, the, something that I chose, and I really have on. God put it in my heart to share this one message. That's all I have, this one message. But it's a two-part message, but it's pretty long. And as the sermon title says, the four pillars of the Bible. Now, the Bible basically is, really, when you really come down to it, it's not a book. It's a library of 66 books that was put together 300 B.C. Now, that being said, um, the interesting thing about this, this book that we have is there are, it was written over a 1,600-year period, and, but there are no contradictions. This book was written on three different continents by three different languages by 40 authors. And yet there are no contradictions. You gotta know that this book, this library, was God ordained. Now let me get into it for you. Now, one of the reasons why I chose this is that very recently, last year in fact, the Pew Research Corporation found out with their uh, research that. 70% of the students who go into the university, go into university as believers, 70% of them come out non-believers. That is really sad. Why is that? It's because they are subjected to people like me, when I was not a Buddhist, uh, when I was not a Christian, I was brought up a Buddhist, and they would rag on my friends and the people that I knew, and say, "You gotta believe? You, you gotta be kidding me? You, you really believe all that fairy tale? That this guy with long hair and white, white long hair and beard does this with his staff and the sea parts?" You believe that? And then there's a boat big enough to carry all the animals? And, and that's not fair to do. It, it cannot be believed. So, even now, what we see is a bombardment by the, the secular media and um, our friends, people that we know, that who were once so-called Christians, but have fallen away. And the Bible calls it apostasy. Okay. So, I feel that we ought to get the word out. Why do we believe in this thing called the Bible? It is God's word. Simple as that. And later on, I will share with you what, what this, uh, this whole thing is. Now, the worst part about it is that in the universities, that's the bastion of the non believers It's come full circle. Because for those of you who know about the history of higher education, as we know it today, its genesis, its start, was a belief in the Bible, a belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the Middle Ages, what happened was that on the banks of the Seine River in France, they used to get together these people who used to go to Notre Dame and things like that. And in those days, the only people that knew how to read and write, really, were the people connected with the church. So they knew that uh, they were looked upon as intellectuals. Now, they would get together in small bunches and they would invite, they would invite uh, people who were looked upon as intellectuals, who had 
the same persuasion of beliefs as them. So the, these people who came obviously were all believers because that's the only people that knew how to live their life. They came to share the various different kinds of uh, interests that the people who were studying uh, these subjects were and the events of the same. And that's where you got the word collegian uh, college from, because they were very collegial people of like mind getting together. Collegial. And that's where you get the word professor from, because these are the pro people who profess to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why they're called professors. But I bet you if you go to any universities today, you wouldn't find too many of them. And they wouldn't even know why they're called professors. They wouldn't know why they're called colleges. The um, sad part about it is that, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they pride themselves in not, not knowing and uh, not believing. But it is quite sad because not believing, I think, for those of us who do believe, sends you down the wrong road, and it's a dead end street, right? And you can't back up. So, um, now, uh, furthermore, the, the colleges and the universities throughout the United States, and we were the young, the model for the whole world, its genesis was in New England, where you had Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all that, those Ivy League schools. All of them, with the exception of one, the Ivy League schools, were all divinity schools. They're all divinity schools today. You, you, you wouldn't want to go there if you want to learn. Christianity, because I don't think they even teach that now. Yet. Okay, moving on. Um, I'd like to start by saying that there are the four pillars, as my, my text says, and if you look at that, it's science, archaeology, and manuscripts and prophecies. That's how I broke it down. Okay, and that's how I see the whole thing. The Bible is supported by those four things, um, four subjects. Now, we obviously cannot come, uh, take that long uh, to, to describe those four things. But before I get into it, let me share with you this one, uh, one way of looking at things. If there's an elephant, and you had three blind people, and somebody says, okay, take two steps forward, touch whatever is in front of you, and in 30 seconds, you back up and share with us what you believe an elephant is. The guy in the back of the elephant, he would say, oh, the elephant is like a tail, I mean, uh, it's like a rope. It's long and it's furry. Okay, see, he obviously was talking about a tail. This other guy says, oh, it's like a trunk of a tree. And he's right. It, the legs are the trunks of the tree. The third one would say, no, 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 no. It's like a boa constrictor. He's long and he's thick. He is, the elephant is a boa constrictor, like a boa constrictor. They're only part right, but in the composite of things, when you put it all together, what it is, is, a, is different. Uh, the, the elephant is not any one of those three. In part they are, and this is what I want to share with you today. Okay. Now, the, uh, let's see now. This person, by, well, before I uh, 
Let me stop it now. Share. Uh, let's pray before I share. Uh, dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come before you with open hearts, open ears, and especially an open mind, Lord. We ask that the Spirit guide us and take us where you would like us to go. Be with us, Lord, and be with me as I share your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, the person I would like to share with you now is this person by the name of Stephen Hawking. Probably all, almost all of you uh, would know who I'm talking about. He is one of the most brilliant minds of the 1900s. He died, but before he died, uh, when he was 22 years old, this brilliant mind contracted Lou Gehrig's disease. We all know what Bill Garrett's disease is. Uh, he become paraplegic, he lose control of his whole body, he had even a hard time talking, if that. But his mind was not affected. And because he could function, his mind could function, he did a lot of intellectual studies. And he was saying, uh, he was quoted as saying um, in the Austin American Statesman as newspaper in 1997. The universe and the law of physics seems to be specifically designed for us. If any one of about 40 physical qualities had known slightly different values, life as we know it could not exist either. Either atoms would not be stable, or they wouldn't be able to combine into molecules, or the stars would form the heavier elements, or the universe would collapse before life could develop. And that's from Stephen Hawking's. A really brilliant mind. You can go home and you can YouTube me, Google him or whatever. Bring his name. He, he is the one that said that. Okay. Now, recently, uh, we've been aware, or we've been told, that the Earth is at least six billion years old. Some even go up to 30 billion years. Okay? You, you, you probably heard that if you did any kind of research. That is what the secular scientists tell you now, or not scientists, but people. Um, but the interesting thing is this. When the moon is moving away from the Earth at the rate of an inch and a half every year. Inch and a half, inch and a half, inch and a half, inch and a half. So if you go back six billion years, you do the math. That's nine billion inches. Divide that by 12 to find the feet. How, how, how much the distance would be in a foot. And it becomes mind-boggling. The moon would not exist as an orb uh, orbital sphere. It would collapse into the Earth. It would be so close. Now, I had a hard time believing that. So I asked my friend, some of you know it, because he used to be coming to his church, Rob Kelso. And by the way, for those of you who were members of the church, he sends his other heart. I just got through talking to him to reconfirm these things. And he's in Houston now. Uh, and for those of you who don't know him, Rob Kelso was the director of mission control out of Houston for NASA for the last 25 space missions before they closed down and he took a job here with Pisces, Pacific International Center for Space uh, Explorations, Pisces. <coughs> and that's how he came to move here, and that's how he came to work here for church. And, and he's a lay pastor at, um, in Houston at the First Baptist Church. Some of you might watch uh, the TV uh, that is, that is in, um, their pastor on TV. But anyway, now, um, 
getting back to, um, I'm going to skip around here, so I'm going to get uh, clear all mixed up. <laughs> but on the other hand, the sun, as huge as it is, basically its composition is helium and oxygen. And it's burning off the helium and the oxygen at the rate that diminishes the radius by five miles every year. It gets small because it's burning off what is made up. Okay. So again, you go back six billion years times five. That's 30 billion feet that the, the sun is shrinking, assuming that it's so. Now if you use 30 billion and you use five months, it's like 150 billion years. Only a dummy would. If somebody told me that, I would look at him and I would wonder if the guy was a politician. Because <laughs> only a politician would talk that stupid. Okay, so um, anyway, if you look, the other thing is that how is it that this is so precise in terms of the ratio? For a long time, from, from the time of the Bible, you, you had an eclipse, okay, in which you could see the corona, the edge of the sun behind the moon, right? How is it that it's so perfect that over the thousands of years, that's the same ratio? Same ratio. From 4000 BC to presently, the ratio, the moon and the sun and the earth lines up that you have a perfect eclipse. There had to be a designer, because this does not happen by chance. Doesn't happen by chance. Yeah. Now, Sir Isaac Newton said, and everybody who know, knows who he is, right? That's the one that the apple that fell on his head. Okay. There is a being who made all things, who hold all these things in power, and is therefore feared. All material things seem to have been composed of hard and solid particles. In the first place, by the counsel of the intelligent agent. For it became him who created them to get them in order. And if it did so, it is unphilosophical to seek for any other origin of the world or pretend that it might arise, <coughs> excuse me, arise out of chaos by the mere laws of nature. Yeah. So Isaac Newton is laying down an argument why we should be in the creator of God. Joseph Lister, who is the guy that invented antiseptic procedures, said, I am a believer in the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. Interesting that these people, these high power thinkers, were convinced that we have a creator. Things that it just happened. And they couldn't. And one logically steps back and starts thinking about it. That's the conclusion, but this is the whole theme of this, this message. Okay, now, let me uh, share with you a partial list of health directions that you find in the Bible. And this is kind of interesting. Okay, the Bible says in Exodus 22, 31, You are my holy people. Do not eat the meat of an animal torn by a wild beast, throw it to the dogs. Don't eat for obvious reasons. In other words, don't eat meat that is out in the fields and has died, and the other animals are eating it. Because you don't know what really that animal really died from. It could be rabies, it could be a whole bunch of stuff which is very contaminated, you know, could be, uh, could contaminate you. And, uh, Okay, let's move on. The other thing is circumcision. The Bible says that the male child ought to be circumcised, not ought to, will be circumcised on the eighth day. Well, it's only recent, only recent that modern science 
realize that the blood clotting factor, thrombin, and, um, is the highest <coughs> for uh, a child on the eighth day. The other thing is that also the immune system of a person supposedly is the highest on the eighth day. Now, um, you can check with Dr. Ben with that. I don't know if he will be to uh, confirm that or not. So that's what, uh, so that's what he said now. So how did this, all these things was laid out by the Bible and Moses wrote that long time ago before he made Christ king. That's the basis of the Old Testament. Uh, this, this all came out of Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, these things that I've shown with you. Now, if a man or a woman has a bodily discharge and they're considered unclean and their clothes and their bodies and their clothes ought to be washed with fresh running water, fresh water, fresh water. It's not just water, fresh water, okay? It wasn't until the 1800s that this, this was uh, totally true. Because prior to that, when surgeons used to do their surgery, they used to apparently wash their hands in a basin, water basin, and go from patient to patient. They were to contaminate one person to the next, to the next. Okay. Now, you're going to like this. In Deuteronomy 28 to 12, um, the Bible says that um, you ought to go outside of camp, dig a hole with a paddle that you should be always carrying, and relieve yourself in that hole. Dig a hole, do your thing, and cover it back up. Outside of camp, not inside. Okay? And it's for obvious reason, not for health reason. Right? So, I was told by a um, rural, how should I say it, um, I, I know Hal uh, Jones, uh, and you, some of you know him too. He's an evangelist uh, and a um, missionary and stuff. And he was sharing with me the fact that there are many places still yet in the world where if you go outside of the camp, there are white spots all over. And I, I couldn't make out what he was talking about. And he said, yeah, because the ground was brown, but underneath was white. So when they dug the, oak, the, the, the sand up, it was white. And when they covered it up, it became white on, on brown. So they did the thing, and they covered it up. And it's today still being practiced in the backwaters. I said, so, who goes where? I said, are there Wahinis one side and <laughs> Kani's one side? He said, some places, but a lot of places it's not. They're all mixed up. I said, oh my goodness, that's interesting. But I thought I'd um, share that with you because it's, it's quite interesting. To me, it was interesting. I don't know how you think it, but uh, you're probably going to ask, that's all you're going to remember from this whole sermon. <laughs> Dig a hole. Okay. Now, it, it says here, uh, verse, uh, Deuteronomy 12, 14, verse 14 reads, For the Lord your God moves about your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see or wrong you anything indecent and turn away from you. That's why you do not do it in the camp. You have to go outside. Okay. Now, let's look at fish and some of the things that you can and cannot eat. Leviticus 11, 9-12 says, Then you can eat all the fish you want, 
but don't give anything from, from the sea or stream that has, that, um, that has uh, without fins and scales. In other words, you can eat the fish with scales and fins, but don't eat other things that don't have that. Okay, that I found very interesting because a lot of people have uh, an allergy to seafood, but they're allergic to crabs, lobsters, opinions, you know, those kind of things, not the fish, not necessarily the fish. I'm one of them, okay. Now, the other parts or other things that the Bible would say um, about science is that the earth in Isaiah it says the earth is spherical, wrong. This was a time when many in the world believed the earth was flat and it was carried on the back of an elephant or at least who held it up or something to that effect, not wrong. But the Bible in Isaiah 40 says the earth is spherical. Job 38, 12 and 14 says the earth rotates on an axis. It rotates on an axis. And Psalm 8.8 8 says there are rivers in the ocean. Rivers in the ocean. Now, it wasn't but maybe a couple hundred years ago that they realized that there are rivers in the ocean because there are currents. In the Atlantic, the Sargasso Sea comes from the Caribbean. If you look at the east coast of the United States, it goes up and around Greenland, Iceland, and comes back down, back in. But it's a huge current. It's like a river in the ocean. In the Pacific, it's called, the Japanese called it a Kuro Shio. Kuro Shio. And it goes from Philippines, goes up the coast of Asia alongside Japan, goes through Alaska, comes down the western coast of uh, the America, North America, and comes back down, comes back into the Central Pacific. And so what you see is that you have an island of trash, especially after the, the earthquake. The uh, what, what was the earthquake's name? Um, anyway, you, you all know that. A lot of the rubbish ended up, right, in, in, in that, that, that whirlpool. So there, there are rivers in the ocean. All right, let's move on. And what about the water cycle? Let's look at Amos 9.6. The Lord calls for the water of the sea and pour them out over the face of the land. And this is the mainly the archaic way of saying, and it's referring to the evaporation of the water in the ocean and then the depositing of that water on the land. The cycle coming down the rivers and re replenishing the, the ocean again. All in the Bible. Okay. Now, let's go on to a kind of an interesting thing Noah's Ark. In 1950 something, there was a pilot, he was flying over Turkey, Mount Ararat, and when he looked down, and he saw the formation of he saw the formation of this outline that looks like a boat. Right? Did you all see it? Okay. So in due time, he had some archaeologists go on site and measure it from here to here. 
And what they came off is that there was a putting in Noah's Ark because the Bible says that it is um, 515 feet. Then, this is only 400, uh, no, I'm sorry. The Bible says it's supposed to be only 468 or something feet. From here to here is 515 feet. So it couldn't be known as well. Ah, but now, when they went back to the King James Version, and they used the cubits, see what happened was that the King James Version said, so many cubits by so many cubits by so many cubits. 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits deep. What happened is the NIV took the liberty to interpret that. And the cubit is, um, is a distance between fingertip to elbow. Okay? And that was a Hebrew cubit. It was about 18 uh, inches or whatever. But the Bible says, you know, the, it, it was like 500 cubits. So something is wrong here. It's not, something is amiss. Then somebody realized that, ah, this book was written by Moses. Moses grew up, was educated in Egypt. He used the Egyptian cubit. Now there are three names, <coughs> either the Egyptian cubit, the royal cubit, or the long cubit, because the cubit was now 20.6 inches. It's not 18 inches. So if you use that, from here to here, is exactly 515 feet. And that's what it is. OK. So. These are all things that is just supporting the uh, the Bible and what 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 the Bible says makes sense. Now the other thing about this is okay. Recently, this guy by the name of Ron Wyatt, uh, he is independently wealthy, and he went out and took a look at this. And what he found was really interesting. From here to here, alongside, there were rivets, metal rivets. That's all in a row, all in line. The wood, the planks that they were used, especially the big timbers, the supporting beams, were like plyboard. It was a plyboard, pitch and tar, plyboard, pitch, uh, wood, pitch and tar, and you know, you, you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's one board with pitch and tar to glue it to the next one, to the next one. And so that was a, like a plywood to me. And everybody knows why you make plywood to give it tensile strength. The, 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 the strength of this lumber becomes really, really great. And that's what they found on that boat. It's, and it's not natural, it's not normal. It's gotta be man made. Okay, now, where are we going with this? Um, if, um, if you look at um, where it was located, it wasn't on Mount Ararat as we know it today. It was on the Mount Ararat range. Mount Ararat is here in Turkey, but there's a mountain range 
and it was on this mountain. But we know this, we would say Makai, towards the ocean, or towards Lower. There were stones, <coughs> no, I would say big rocks. Rocks perhaps maybe up to 10 feet tall. About this wide, this tall. And there were holes in the top of them where you could put rope. And what they would do is it was known as ballast rocks. They would hang it on the side so that the boat wouldn't tip over in high seas. And they found a whole bunch of them. You see that? You see the hole? Oops. You see the hole there? Yeah. Those, those, those holes were used to put ropes to hang, to put on the side of the arm. So that it won't pull you over. It won't flip over on high seas. But the bunch of them lower than the ark itself. Really, really interesting. Why in the world would somebody take a boat that is 515 feet, it's almost two football fields long, up to the top of the mountain? Yeah, okay. Now, let's move on. The parting of the Red Sea, that's another fairy tale, right? Yeah. Okay, when I was growing up, I go to Hilo Tierra and there's a red that they are, Ten Commandments. And I see this holy guy, he goes to the ocean and he has this, and, and the ocean <coughs> opens up, right? It's going to be a fairy tale. But you know what? Recently, this guy, Don Wyatt, I think it was about 20 years ago, he found where the, the crossing of the Red Sea was. Really interesting. Now, if we can get um, the map of that, um, clear if you can get a map of the, where it was. This is the Suez Canal here. The Red Sea goes down here. And this is the uh, eastern arm of the Red Sea. Egypt, uh, Israel goes here, like this. So that's the tip. Okay. But right here, really interesting. Supposedly, they came down here and crossed here. You got that? Okay. On this side and this side. And on both sides, were big canyons, like uh, where you could see the water bringing down the sand, the sand to the ocean. And so, on the top side, is 3,000 feet deep, both sides, 3,000. But right here, is only 200 feet deep. And what they found, what they found at the bottom there, were the remains of chariots. The wheels. And it was on the, the bottom of the sea floor. And what you see is tall and crusted chariot wheel. And you know when that chariot and what because of the style what kind of chariot it was. It was an Egyptian chariot from that certain pharaoh, that time of the crossing, the matches, everything. And they found Egyptian armor, and they found horse, cross hooves, and crossed it with coral. It's crazy, it's mind boggling Now, they also found, if you were, if you back up to the other, uh, the previous uh, one, Again, yeah. on, on this side, the Egyptian side, and on this side, they found two columns 
I'm not columns, all right. Will you choose it to be the school? We have those columns. Okay. On the Egyptian side and the Saudi side, they found the remains of these two columns. The some were broken. And there were inscriptions. <coughs> and they know that this was from um, Solomon. King Solomon had it erected in commemoration of the J.C. crossing. So now, on those two, and they, that's a column, one from the Egyptian side and one on the Arabian side, commemorating and identifying where the Red Sea crossing was. Okay, all right. Let's move on. We got plenty of ground to cover, but we're almost there. <laughs> now let's look at um, um, the. What do you call that? Uh, uh, evolution. There are certain things that I would like to point out to you, the evolution. Okay. You, you talk about the Piltdown Man. In, in, in 1912, the, the Piltdown Man was discovered. Now, the Piltdown Man then, they found out later on, way back in uh, 1954, I believe, that there was a hoax because the Piltdown Man uh, was a composite uh, of, of a 600-year-old skull and a jaw of a 500-year-old orangutan. The Nebraska Man got, uh, was identified as a man by a single tooth from an in, in extinct pig. And the Java man had a piece of a skull, a fragment of a tie, and three molars, and he was called the Java man. Today, and the Heidelberg man had a jaw and chin to qualify as fully human. And lastly, the Neanderthal man, they found out and they said that he really wasn't a man because he moved around, you know, he, didn't, he wasn't totally erect. Well, he wasn't totally erect because a guy had arthritis in the back, in his spine. <laughs> and that's the reason why. Okay. In other words, all of these guys say that th these are all hopes. Okay. So, let me quote to you, and we're almost there from Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, who used to be at Clemson University and was a director of the life sciences. And he's now at, um, at the writing uh, creative research. That human chimps were 99% similar. He said that the previous claims that human chimps were 99% similar to total uh, Hawaiian uh, human beings was nonsense, quote unquote. Uh, because the human genome was 4 to 5% from one person to another. In other words, the person sitting next to you, the closest genome that they have would be about 4 to 5% close. But there are people who are saying that the chimpanzees had 2%. Um, the difference was only 2%. So I gotta ask you, so I took a look at your guy sitting next to you. He might be half chimpanzee. He might be a chimpanzee. He's not a human. Based on uh, the previous convention. Okay. Now. So. Let, let me uh, just go into you about. Uh, I'm going to skip this part here just for the sake of brevity. Uh, but let me go into, again, Apollo 8. And this Apollo mission happened in 1968 in December. There were three astronauts that circled the moon. 
And it just so happened that on Christmas Eve, they were up there. And they were told by mission control, you can say something, you know, with, you know, uh, uh, something appropriate if you want to. What the three of them decided, amongst the three of them, they read from Genesis 1 through 10. And they still talk about it today. And this is the reason why I say that, you know, mission control, 75% are Christians. Yeah. And like Rob says, if you know what we know, you will, you will become Christians. You will be Christians. Yeah. Now, one of the last parts that I want to say is that the other thing that was discovered, quote unquote, is this place called Tal El Haman. Okay? Now, the sulfur that we find in Kilauea, in Kilauea, in Kilauea and wherever, that sulfur is only 50% pure. It's mixed up with all other kinds of stuff. Okay? And it's, it's not solid. On the other hand, what we found here, uh, and next to the Dead Sea, was 95 plus percent pure sulfur. And it came in balls, various different sized balls. And there were burnt villages, towns that they knew was burnt. So they're now thinking, they're contemplating the fact that could this be the site of Sodom and Gomorrah, where fire and brimstone was brought down by the Lord in his wrath against what we were doing. But these are the new discoveries. Okay. <coughs> now, He, we talk about the students, and we talk about they're being exposed to other kinds of teachings, and some of the things that doesn't make sense out in school. And that's why I'm glad that we have some young people here that they can be forearmed with, with that. Okay, and like the Bible, Baptist uh, Christian ministry, Got the student ministry. Uh, Anita Weiss, she came to this church uh, and spoke. The right by the university. Oh, yes. Yeah. up here. Got the student ministries. Um, she did, I had a talk with her too, and she says, yeah, they try to uh, promote this. Well, why you should be using the Bible? In other words, apologize. Okay. And it is, uh, I, the Bible says that we got to know apologetics. Uh, I'm going to end it here. Uh, but next week we will cover the other two things. It will be not as long as this, maybe one half. <laughs> so, Otherwise, my, my wife is back there, and she's, she thinks she's at uh, aerobics or something. She feels really good. Like that, you know. I, make, I, I, don't, I don't look there. I, I read a book. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's see now. In closing, I'd just like to say this. Again, remind you that the Bible is always, always, always true. First Peter 3, 15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone or everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, you better be able, if somebody challenges you why you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you ought to be able to say, I can, I, I have the confidence I can, I can tell you. Okay? 
Yeah. Anyway, um, that basically is uh, the end of my first part. So next week we'll do the second part. And I, I hope it will be interesting enough to send you come back to, um, to hear that part. Uh, yeah. So we, we do have a uh, we have an almighty, great, amazing God. It's not just to sing songs to you, and then when you really come down to it, our world is an amazing God. Thank you very much. Well, we could assume that things just happened. That maybe just, those were just circumstances just turned out and things matched up. But, I don't know, I turned uh, 75 years old last week. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And the longer I stay on the planet, the more I find out there aren't accidents. That things happen because God has a purpose for them to happen. As he had in all those examples that Harvey was talking about. But let's get personal. Today, you and I are here, and I don't think that's an accident. I think God had a purpose for each of you who came here today. Perhaps there was something in this presentation by Harvey that you needed to hear. Perhaps you're not sure about whether the Word of God is true. Perhaps you're not sure if, if there's a God at all in your life. Well, let me give you some other evidence. I grew up uh, in the Lutheran Church as a kid. And then after I went on my merry way and on to college and started doing other things, I walked away from God from 16 years of my life. And on the outside, it looked very successful what I was doing. Everything looked fine. But after a divorce and after many troubles, the difficulty I found was that when things started unraveling in my life, I didn't know where to turn. You see, I thought that my dad said, well, you know, you, know, you you can, you know, you've got to do your, you got to do your damnedest. You got to get out there and, you know, you know, make it work. And he was right that there's a lot of self responsibility which is meant. But he also had told me that to turn to God when you don't know what to do. Too many times, can you can you relate to this? We try. We try to just figure it out all by ourselves. Today, perhaps you're faced with things going on in your life and you're not sure how to address them in your life. And I would encourage you to do, to ask God to lead your life. I would also ask you, kind of the going along with what Harvey's saying, is that you turn to this book a uh, country preacher that I first heard in Wyoming years ago, he came up and he said, you do know what this stands for, B-I-B-L-E? And we all looked there, there and said, yeah, that's the Bible, the Holy Bible. No, he said, it's not that. It's basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah, so if you don't know what to do, Seek the Word of God, because these are the basic instructions that you need. I don't care who you are today. I don't care how successful you think you have been. Your life is a mess unless you're acquainted with this book, and that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that if there's anyone here who, after hearing these words about the about what we know about the Word of God, what we know about science, what we've heard, just different evidence. If there's things that you're finding, you've tried doing it all by yourself. You've been driving the steering wheel of your life for
for some time and you'd like for us to pray with you this morning, I'd be happy to do that. I know other deacons here, we'd be happy to pray with you. Just pray that you would come forward, stand here with me, and we just would love to do that. And if you say, hey, I've heard this song and dance before, I, mean, I don't do that. I don't stand up there and you know, share that with a bunch of people. I get that. Then where you are, I would just pray that silently right now, let's just bow our heads in prayer and just pray this prayer or something like it. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your basic instructions before leaving earth. We thank you for the everlasting truth that is found in this book. We pray, Lord, that on this day that you would allow us to come to you and have a relationship with you. We pray that you would lead our life. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray now that you would be the leader of my life. And we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. And now let's say it so that he can hear it. Amen. 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 something <laughs> you know when you get old your eyes go so you get glasses right then the hearing goes so you get hearing aid like me and then when your mind goes you get a wife <laughs> she tells me what to do so when I walk back there and, and she tells me I forgot something and I did forget something I'm, I'm honored to introduce to you folks uh, the person that led me in good part to the Lord and uh, baptized me and my wife, and that's a former pastor of Healing Missionary Church, Niles and Eileen Kalmiyama. They're sitting right over there. Niles, you don't stand up. I know you don't feel that uncomfortable. You go for a boy, but...
continue to work in each and every one of our hearts, dear Lord. We thank you for all of your creations, dear Lord, that man could never design. Dear Lord, there is only one creator, and that is you. And so, Lord, we thank you for all of the many gifts that you provide us with. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this week. We pray that as we go out this week, that you will continue to just guide us in all that we need to do. Continue to do all of your purposes in all of your ways. In Jesus' name.